Good morning. I want to welcome everybody to the adult Sunday school class. I also want to take this moment to congratulate all of our mothers on Mother's Day. God bless you and we thank God for you. Let's take our hymn books and turn to page 143. Page 143 and we're going to sing Blessed Assurance. If you're able, let us all stand together as we take this opportunity to sing unto the Lord. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Let's pick it up on the third verse. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, I'm happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. All right, thank you for your singing. You may be seated. Let's have Brother Kevin and Brother Bill come at this time. We'll go ahead and take up an offering allowing you to give unto the Lord that which he's trusted to your care and giving you an opportunity to exercise your personal stewardship. Uh, all finances, uh, all time, talent, that all should be surrendered unto the Lord as a good steward of the Lord. And I've learned over the years that you can't outgive God and uh, given biblically. Somebody says, well, it don't matter how you give. Well, if, if you don't want to look at the Bible's interpretation of that, that's true. But the Bible deals with that subject very clearly, and we're very thankful for the opportunity to give unto the Lord what he has trusted to our care. Fact of the matter is, everything in the Christian's life belongs to God. We ought to love him enough to represent him with our stewardship and giving back to him a portion of what this past paycheck was all from him. It's not you. You think, I worked for it. No, I, God helped you work for it. Yeah. And sometimes we take that for granted. And when we do, boy, things start to get lean and things start to get tight. And God don't want you to live in leanness. He doesn't want you to live in tightness. He wants you to live abundantly. So giving, it's a wonderful part of the Christian life that I would never underestimate. We call these men for it on purpose. We're praying for it on purpose. And I just remind us that everything we have is of the Lord. This is just an opportunity to show him how much we have appreciate what he's given us in our finances and we give back to him proportionally first day of the week and here we are so let's pray thank you father for this opportunity this morning to give back unto you all that you've given us we could never repay you or thank you enough for but we can honor you with the tenth or the free will giving or the missions giving or whatever it is help us to be good stewards of the things that's yours Help us to be faithful stewards of the things that are yours. Help us to abide by your written word that we can see the fruit that comes from obeying thy word. Bless now this offering, the gift and the giver, and this time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 
All right, men, let's go ahead and move forward. This morning, I'd like for you to take your Bibles and we'll, we're gonna go around a little bit this morning, but we're gonna start at Matthew chapter three. Matthew chapter three. We are gonna be going back and forth in the word of God this morning. I'm gonna be asking you to, to turn. We're gonna be doing something a little bit different with this particular lesson. And that is we, I feel the importance of teaching this lesson to you personally. Um, I, I feel the importance of teaching it to you personally. I know that some of you are taking these lessons home and I commend you for that. You're, you're balancing your structured schedule. You're setting time alone for God to minister to your heart through these lessons. And I commend you and I continue, continue to encourage you to do that. Um, even if you've done less than 10 times, what did page three topic number? What is the kingdom of God? What does it represent? And, and so many times we need our mind sharpened up because we are people that are prone to forget. But this particular lesson, we're going to go over very carefully, and it may take us three or four weeks, but I want this truth to be understood because of the blessing that lies behind it. And we are dealing with the letter K, and the letter K stands for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. I use a Schofield study Bible. Um, it's just a present that was given to me when I was ordained by my pastor and I've used them, um, and I believe that uh, Mr. Schofield, and not just Mr. Schofield, because this is not the Schofield Study Bible, uh, per se. When you look at the Schofield Study Bible, you have Henry Weston, you have James Gray, you have William Erdman, you have Arthur Pearson, you have W.G. Moorhead, you have Elmer Harrison, you have Arno Giblian, you have William Pentagill, them are all contributing to this particular study Bible. So it's not the Schofield study Bible per se, although he compiled these men together, but the Schofield Bible gives a lot of notes about what we would call the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven. And I personally believe that 99% of them are wrong. 99% of his notes on this are wrong. And for that reason, there has been just an adaptive thought of, of the teaching of the kingdom of God, something like this, that Jesus Christ came with the sole purpose, the sole purpose of setting up an earthly kingdom with Israel. That's why he came. And if Israel would have accepted him as Messiah during that particular part of his ministry, he would have set up his kingdom and we know um, that he would have ruled and reigned. So the first thought would be that he came to set up a kingdom on earth, but because it was rejected by the Jews, plans changed to an extent to the calling out of the Gentiles. It's not true at all. Jesus Christ, the first time he came here on earth, never came to set up an earthly kingdom. Never came to do that. He came to save. He take, came to give salvation. And he came to seek and save that which was lost. That was his goal. And I want to help us with this thought, so I want you to do a thorough study about this, and we're going to do it together. So Matthew chapter 3, we're just going to look at two verses. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now some would interpret that to mean that if Israel would accept him, they could set the kingdom up right then, the physical earthly kingdom right then. Is that true though? Is that true? Well, let me just say when it comes to the kingdom of God, it is a major doctrine and it is a major teaching throughout Holy Scripture. It is taught in the Old Testament by some of the major, what we would call major prophets. But it's a constant theme from Matthew to the book of the Revelation in the New Testament. That is the kingdom of God. There's a lot of misunderstanding concerning this particular doctrine, a lot of misinterpretation concerning this doctrine, and a lot of misapplication concerning this particular doctrine, which have led to, to great errors. Um, one of the great errors is that 
because of this doctrine being taught that Jesus came to set up an earthly kingdom and if the Jewish people would have accepted him as Messiah, he'd have set up his kingdom. Uh, but because he didn't, plans change. Because of that particular teaching, there are those that believe there is another gospel or two gospels. That the gospel during the kingdom age of Christ on earth, let me use that subject, thought, that the gospel that Jesus offered during his earthly ministry is not the gospel that we preach today. And you'd be surprised at Baptist people who believe that and, and, and have never really checked this. So if people don't believe that you were saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ in which he preached in his earthly ministry, which by the way, Jesus said, this gospel shall be preached unto all the ends of the world, then shall the end come. Amen. The world is not ended, the end has not come. Amen. Just to, And as a side note, but we'll get into this, but then if we're not saved by the gospel to Jesus, what was the gospel of Jesus Christ? How, did they, how were they saved then? They were saved by baptism, they were saved by works, they were saved by selling everything they had. And there's a lot of Baptists that teach this. And then since the Jews rejected him, that gospel stopped towards the nation of Israel. And Paul was, re, was given a, an exclusive revelation about the pure gospel of grace. And now you're saved by grace and grace alone. You don't need to be baptized. And, you're, and we are saved by grace and grace alone. But you should follow Christ in believer's baptism. And there's a lot of truth. And we would call this, there's a church in the Moores Hill area. It's called Abundant Grace. They teach this doctrine. No such thing as a local New Testament church as in a sense of Christ. No such thing as believer's baptism. No such thing as systematic giving. And they teach that you're, no such thing as confessing sin once you're saved because the grace that God um, has given man and our dispensation is so abundant that it covers all your sin. And regardless of what you do, that grace is over your sin. And they make a doctrine out of this by confusing the recipients. But the fact of the matter is the Bible, Paul the Apostle said what saved him. That was the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And Paul said, if any man teach any other gospel unto you than which I have delivered unto you, let him be accursed. Now, in the sense of baptism, Paul was baptizing 30 years almost after he was saved. In the book of Acts, he rebaptized John the Baptist as converts. You just got to study the Bible and know these things, which some people don't maybe, uh, well, that might have been just a certain instance. No, it wasn't a certain instance. Uh, they had a wrong baptism. They were confused about faith. So let's look into this. First of all, we're going to ask the question, what is the kingdom of God? When we read this in the Bible, what is the kingdom of God? Well, the word in your definition of kingdom would be the power or authority of a king. It's pretty obvious. So a kingdom would be defined as the power or authority of a king or and the dominion over which that kingdom extends. So the kingdom of God is both the rule of God, the kingdom of God is the rule of God because Christ is king and it is the extent of his rule. So there's two thoughts here. Now, are there other names used in the scriptures concerning this word kingdom of God? Yes, take your Bibles, let's go. Now we're gonna do a little turning here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. And if you want to just listen, I'm not going to, I never purposefully misquote any scripture, but I'm not going to misquote anything. But if you can listen, you can listen. But let's look at some of the other names for the kingdom of God that are in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Paul says, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, now listen to the end of this scripture, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. 
Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Turn back just a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. These are other names pertaining unto the kingdom of God found in the Bible. We're particularly focusing on in the mouth of two or three witnesses. We'll look at a few more. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 and 10 says this. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 5 verse 21. Galatians chapter 5, verse 21. Let's turn there. Starting at verse number 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revealings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's go to Colossians chapter number one. Other names paralleling and lining up with the name or the phrase, or the words, kingdom of God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Verse 13 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Let's look at one more, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we note here the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now, let's think about this subject because in the Bible, this is where the doctrine can get messed up at. Some would say there's a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. But is that justifiable? If you believe that, can you justify it? I don't, you can't justify it with scripture. But let's, let's look at this. Because the gospel of Matthew, he uses a term all over and over about the kingdom of heaven. And they talk, or some would teach that the kingdom of heaven is not the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is not the kingdom of heaven. They're distinct. <clears throat> well, we need to look at this. Now, let me say one thing about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is particular and peculiar to Matthew. To Matthew. Matthew has his own literary li uh, liberty as he writes. Matthew uses the word kingdom of heaven. Mark uses the kingdom of God. But are they different? Are they teaching us a different doctrine? Is Matthew teaching us one doctrine and Luke teaching another doctrine? So the term kingdom of heaven we find primarily in the gospel of Matthew. And then in other gospels we find the kingdom of God. 
is there any differences? Are they the same or are they different? Okay, let's go to Matthew chapter 4. I'm just going to have you go there, then I'm going to quote a couple pieces of scripture. Matthew chapter number 4. Now in Matthew chapter 4, let's think of, this is very important, the context. What's going on here? Jesus has been baptized. He has made his way up into the mountain. He is there. The Bible teaches us in chapter number 4, 40 days and 40 nights fasting. And Satan shows up. And Satan starts to question Christ. And if we will tempt him. So we know the context here. Now Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. After this temptation with Satan. He departed into Galilee. And the Bible says in verse 17. From that time. Jesus began to preach and to say. Now watch. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Clearly, Matthew says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But now listen to me, and you can write these notes down. The Gospel of Mark, which records the same context, the same thought in chapter 1. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beast. And the angels ministered unto him. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So in the context of Mark, it's the exact context of Matthew is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven different here? Let me quote to you Luke chapter number 4. Listen to verse 43. Again, same context. And when he was departed, he went into a desert place and the people sought him and came unto him. And they didn't want him to depart. Listen to verse 43. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. And he preached in the synagogue of Galilee. All right. Now, according to Matthew, he used the term kingdom of heaven. Mark, same context, uses the word kingdom of God. Luke, same context, used the word kingdom of God. So Luke, Matthew, and Mark, there is no contradiction. They're the same thing. There's no difference here. They're, they're exactly the same thing. Um, go to Matthew chapter 5. Since you're in chapter 4, go to chapter 5. I want us to see is there a difference in these two thoughts, which a lot of people will say there's a difference in them. There is no difference in them. And I can tell you this. This is a teaching that I'm, my experience is most pastors don't even know. They have no idea about this. And they, they wouldn't even want to get into the study of it because they would be, I'm not saying clueless. I think they would have some sort of idea or indication about the subject, but I do not believe they would not know the right, right way to divide it. Now, Matthew chapter 5, verse number 3. This is the great Sermon on the Mount, isn't it? Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are the hunger and the thirst. Okay, blessed are the poor in spirit, chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now listen, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here Matthew is using that word kingdom of heaven again. Blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, let me quote to you Luke chapter number 6, verse number 20, which is same context, but the gospel of Luke. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So same truth, 
Same doctrine, same principle, same precept. Matthew uses the kingdom of heaven. Luke uses the kingdom of God. Go from Matthew chapter 5. Go over to chapter 8 with me. Go to chapter 8. Matthew chapter number 8, look at verse 11 with me. Jesus says, And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of what? Heaven. In the kingdom of heaven. But listen to what Luke says about the exact same context, the exact same thought. I'm going to quote to you Luke chapter 13, verse 28 and 29. Here it is. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. They shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall set down in the kingdom of God. Well, Matthew says... Many shall come from the east and west and shall shut down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What is it? Is it the kingdom of heaven they're going to set down with? Or is it the kingdom of God they're going to set down with these saints? Well, they're the same. They're the same. The conclusion you to take, and I'm telling you, there is a lot of teachings with this. To take these two parallel contextual truths and to try to separate these two when they're in the same context is absolutely dangerous that's why we do not and will not tolerate that that's very dangerous to take the same text and and many would say this well you're not rightly dividing it (laughs) you're wrongly dividing it you're taking a plain text that uses two different words from two different authors that God has given liberty to write by holy inspiration with their own literature type style, you're taking the same context with the same truth, with the same teaching, and you're trying to teach they teach something totally different. Uh Uh-uh. That is an abuse of scripture, friend. And here's what sometimes these would say, they that do this, people who do this, they say, you're not rightly dividing the word of God. And, and that's, 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 that is just an excuse to take you off into um, Alice, take you a walk with Alice in Wonderland. You get carried away with this stuff as a Christian. You, you, you can find yourself wanting to go back home. Now, while you're in Matthew chapter 8, let's look at another one. Go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, excuse me. By the way, I I think this is going to take us three more weeks to go over this whole subject. When I'm done with this, you're going to know exactly what the Bible means about the kingdom of God. You're going to know exactly what it means biblically. Now, Matthew chapter 10, you're right there. Look at verse 7. Well, if we back up here, the Bible says in verse 5, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go preach, saying, The kingdom of what? Heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Listen to what Luke says, same context, chapter 9, verse 2. We'll go to verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and the cured diseases, and he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Same context. Matthew uses the kingdom of heaven. Luke, again, uses the kingdom of God. Let's go to one more. Matthew chapter 11. Now why is this so important? Let me jump ahead of myself. To get into a kingdom 
There is something you've got to do personally to get admittance. And this leads to a lot of confusion on what it means to be saved. And I mean a lot. But it shouldn't be. Matthew chapter 11, look at verse number 10, and we'll read to verse 11. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger, and that's John the Baptist, before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now listen to what Luke says in the same context. Chapter 7, verse 27. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, Among those that are born of woman, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. Same context. What does Matthew use? Kingdom of heaven. What does Luke use? Again, the kingdom of God. So here's the question that you got to ask yourself as a student of the Bible. Is the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God different or are they the same? If you say they're different, I have no idea how you could say that, and I have no idea how you can get that. Not with what we just read. I have no idea how you, I don't know how you can come up with that. Again, with what we just read, six pieces of scripture comparing Matthew, Luke, and Mark. Is the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God different? No. Are they the same? Yes, they are the same. Now listen carefully to me. I'm going to jump ahead of myself a little bit to try to make some sense out of this. Because you may be thinking, well, God talks about setting up an earthly kingdom. Yeah, he does. Well, and the Bible talks about the kingdom of God cometh not with looks. You can't see it. Yeah, it does. Well, the Bible also talks about that Jesus Christ is going to deliver up the kingdom to God the Father. Amen. You're right. One kingdom. One kingdom. Three phases. Amen. Phase one, I am in right now by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Phase two will be when he sets up his 1,000 year earthly millennial reign. Phase three is when Christ, and we'll teach you all this, is when Christ takes his kingdom for 1,000 years and he delivers it up to God the Father. One kingdom, three phases. How many ever heard that? Did you hear from here or you knew that? You heard it from here? That's what I thought. You probably have never heard that. But I got to wonder, why? Why is that? So one kingdom, yes. Three phases. Okay, I want you to keep that in mind. Now, we see that according to Matthew, Luke, and Mark, well, what about John? How come John doesn't say nothing like this? Because John really refers to Christ as God, and it's kind of above, not without, but kind of above the thought of what we're discussing. So we see that they are the same according to the Bible. Now, the second question is this. Who belongs to the kingdom of God? How do you get in it? Or who belongs to it? Where, where is it? Who belongs to the kingdom of God? Now, keep in mind the definition. If the kingdom of God is the rule and realm of God, who are the subjects? Because if a man is a king, if someone says... How are you doing today, sir? And he's dressed in all this royal apparel and he gets out in this big white limousine and you, he says, hi. And you said, hi, how, how are you doing? Boy, it's a fancy car. Are you kind of, are you some kind of president? Nope. Well, what are you? I'm a king. Oh, what kingdom do you rule over? Every king 
has got a kingdom, he's got a territory, and he's, watch, he's got people. If you are a Christian, and you say Christ is your Lord and Savior, you are to be submitted totally to the king's lordship. If you're a Christian. And sometimes we got to wonder, am am I submitted to this the way I need to? And I would say that sometimes we just don't know this truth. It's like, well, I've never looked at it that way, Pastor. So who belongs to the kingdom of God? Now, first of all, let me just say this. If I want to go to Canada, which God will, and I'll be going to maybe in a few weeks, three or four weeks, I'm going to go to Canada. And if I'm going to go to Canada, I just don't drive through Canada and say, see you later, guys. They will swarm me. They will pull out machine guns and say, get out of the car. You know what they want? They want to see my United States citizenship and they want to see a passport that grants me access into that country or kingdom. If the kingdom of God is the rule and reign and the sphere and the realm of God's reign, how do you get into it? Because as an individual, you just can't walk into it. How do you get into this kingdom? So we got to ask ourselves this question, to who belongs to the kingdom? Let me just say this, as you should know, every kingdom or the kingdom of God, particularly the Bible teaches us this, the kingdom of God must be entered into. We hear subjects like, and right, I'm the door. If you want to get to him, you're going to have to come to me. You hear things, and that's in John chapter 10. You hear the Lord saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now keep in mind, God's kingdom is perfect. It's holy. It's absolutely splendid in its environment. You and I got a sin problem. We all know that. Uh, They bought a house up the road the other day. And I'm not saying where, but I was noticing this house up by Scott and Brother Scott and I. And uh, I knew the family that lived there, and I don't know them that well. I never go into their house. Their son came down to mine every now and then. But they put the house up for sale. And I noticed that because we take note of it. And it was up for sale for just two days. And I thought, wow. My wife said, you see the house sold? I said, yeah. So yesterday, I came through there early in the morning and on my way back. Um, I looked and there's about four or five cars out there and they got the doors open, windows open, and it, I suppose they're remodeling. And so last night I had to go pick up Kato because we let him down to the park to go play basketball. I went by there, it was all closed up and out in the driveway I had this big pile of carpet. And you know, I, I'm not nosy, but I, sl- I, was, I was just going slow. And man, that carpet looked nasty. And I thought, who in the world would live in a place like that? Nasty. I'm thinking, that woman don't take care of her home and who, or whatever, lazy around the house, dishes, I don't know. I, you know I, I, that came to my mind. Now, I could be very wrong here. But what they were doing, they were gutting that house out because it was filthy inside. That's how me and you live, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. You got any dishes in your dish sink right now? Do you? Not a one. No, my wife, no. Carpets vacuum twice a day. House is straightened up twice a day. Dishes are done three times a day. No, none of that stuff. None of that. No. You know, and so what I'm getting at is heaven is not like this. Heaven is a perfect place. But we're used to something that's a little bit different. Now, what is the requirement, therefore, of entering in? If I got to enter into this, what do I need? Number one, you need righteousness. You've got to have righteousness. Now, can I say something about our righteousness? Isaiah chapter 64 says this. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. So I'm out right there. I'm out right there. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm out right there too. So how am I going to get this righteousness? Well, there happens to be someone that God sent named Jesus Christ who has the ability to remove your sin and give you what you don't have. We talk about being born again, and we're very serious about it. We're talking about righteousness that comes from Christ. Okay, now listen. I'm going to quote to you, Matthew, if you're in your Bible, chapter 5. Our time is getting away from us. Verse 20. 
For Jesus said this, I want you to hear this. I'm saying that the kingdom must be entered into and the requirements for entrance, number one, is righteousness. To enter into this kingdom, it takes righteousness. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, For I say unto you, listen carefully, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, religious people, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. You ain't getting in there. They ain't getting in there. Them are men who fasted, holy men, separated in the synagogue every day, in the prayer market every day. Jesus said, if your righteousness is no better than theirs, you ain't entering this kingdom. Is that what he says? Let me read it again. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of God. Ye have heard that it has been said of them of old, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a call shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother Rasa shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Now, What I'm saying is this, uh, God looks into your heart. He looks into your heart. You look, you ain't getting to this kingdom by being a preacher. You ain't getting into this kingdom by giving your offering. You ain't getting into this kingdom by the Lord's Supper. You ain't getting into this kingdom by that baptismal water. You ain't getting into this kingdom by following a golden rule. That's not what the Bible teaches. One of the requirements is righteous. And Jesus said, by the way, how do you know that? Because the scribes and the Pharisees did all that stuff every day far more than me and you do. That was part of their everyday life. The scribes and the Pharisees were probably more dedicated than you and I could and, uh, ever think of being. Now, let me tell you another part, a requirement. Number two, that is required to enter into the kingdom of God. You've got to do God's will. You got to do God's will. This is what the Bible says. Let me quote to you. Um, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Listen carefully. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, we already found out that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same. Jesus says, Not everybody that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, listen. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. What's he saying? Real simple. Not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, except those who do the will of the Father. So big scratcher right here. What is the will of the Father? What is the will of the Father? Because whatever it is, I've got to do to get into this kingdom. And by the way, what I'm about to say does not separate from righteousness. Jesus said this, This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son may believe on him. What's God's will? Believe in Jesus Christ. That everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. But that, look, what did Peter say in 2 Peter 3, 9? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What's God's will for the whole world today? That they would repent of sin, that they would put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He says, if you don't believe and do the will of God the Father, you can't come in here. So it must be received. It must be received. And what do you got to receive? You got to receive the righteousness. It must be entered into. You must be converted. You can't get to the kingdom of God without being converted. Matthew 18, 3, listen. And said, verily I say unto you, except ye be converted as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You got to be converted. Righteousness is a converting factor. God's love for us. God, God, what do you want me to do? I want to be where you're at. What do you want me to do? God says, there's my son. Hear ye him and believe in him. That's his will. All right. You got to be born again. There's another term. The Bible says Jesus answered in John 3, 
verses 5 through 7. Verily I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and spirit. Now that's two births there. Water and spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. So he's talking about you got two births. You got a natural birth or a flesh birth that you were conceived in for nine months in your mother's womb. The water broke, you came out. That birth will not get you in there. You need a second birth. The second birth is not of the water, it's of the spirit. Pretty simple, ladies and gentlemen. That is no way, shape, or... That word don't even mean baptism. That word doesn't even mean water baptism. And we got a lot that will take that interpretation like that, though. That's not what he's saying. Two births. Except the man be born of water and spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. I had a flesh birth, 1971... March the 18th, I had a flesh birth. The water broke, I am, I am. My spiritual birth was, you know, years later. You gotta be converted. You gotta be, when you put all this together, you can't get something else out of it. You gotta be converted, you gotta have righteousness. It's gotta exceed the scribes and the Pharisees. They had their baptisms. They had their rituals, they had their ordinances, they had their Passover. Jesus said, "Uh uh-uh, not gonna work here. Well, what's the will of God the Father? That we believe on him whom he has sent. Uh, let me just say this. In order to enter into God's kingdom, we must be translated from the power of darkness. We must be translated from the power of darkness. That goes back to being born again, uh, being converted. That goes back to doing the will of the Father, which, Joe, I want you to be saved. I said, okay, that's God's will for me. Yes, God wants you to be one of his children. Okay. Translated, Colossians 1.13 says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I'm in it right now. I'm in it right now. Now, I'm in phase one, but I'm in it right now. Now, what about hindrances? What hinders you from getting into this kingdom? What, what keeps men out? Number one, riches. Keeps a lot of people out of church, too money. It's the root of all. There's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with having a whole bunch of it. But as long as it don't have a whole bunch of you. Trusting in riches. Well, here's what he says. Matthew chapter 19. Listen carefully to verse 23 and 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven can't get to heaven by being uh, rich and that'll keep you out of there. Go. Uh, Lord, I've observed these commandments since I've been a youth. What do I like? He says, go and sell what you have and give unto the poor and you have treasure in heaven. Uh-uh, but he walked away being sad. He ain't doing that. Kept him out of that. Riches will keep a man or a woman out of that kingdom. Religion. Religion. Matthew chapter 23, listen to verse number 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Watch this. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye that are going, that are entering to go in. I'm going to read that again. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. These were religious people. Hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You know what he was telling them? Your teaching sends men to hell. How, how, what do you think about that? That is what Christ is telling the scribes and Pharisees. You send people to hell by your teaching. Religion. Religion can definitely be a hindrance. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. So they're getting in the way of people that are trusting Christ. Oh, you'd be amazed today at the churches that get involved interfering with the pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Years ago, I had a man, and I'll conclude with this. Well, let me say sin. Sin can be a hindrance. Can sin be a hindrance? Yes, it can be a hindrance. The Bible says if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. If your foot offends you, cut it off. For it is better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye, one eye, than having two eyes and cast into hell. Sin. We sin with the eye, we sin with the touch. Sin. 
Oh, I don't know if I'm wanting to get to. Sin keeps a man from trusting Christ. Would you say amen? amen. Pretty simple, isn't it? Now, pride can be a hindrance. Wow, I'm pretty. I'm all right. Mm, sir, you're not all right. Come on, man. Be honest with yourself. What does Mark say in chapter 10, verse 15? Verily I say unto you. Watch this. I'm talking about pride. Listen carefully. You know the saying, but listen to the application. Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall not enter therein. You know what that little child's got in his heart? Humility, not pride. you got to receive this in a humble way. Well, I think I'm all right. I think I'll just take my chances. You're crazy. You're crazy. So listen, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. Every believer who trusts in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ enters into that kingdom the moment they call on Jesus Christ. His righteousness is given. You are converted. You have humbled yourself to the will of God the Father. You are born again. You get your names written in the Lamb's book of life. You become a citizen of God, and you are in the kingdom. Right? I'm in it right now. I'm in it right now. And we'll talk about this. Jesus uh, talked about this, and we're going to talk a little bit more. We're going to have to stop. I need to talk next week a little bit more on our next part, but that's all we can talk about today because of our time getting away from, away from us. But the kingdom of God, ladies and gentlemen, is, is something that you and I need to be very careful with. In, in the sense of biblical teaching. And we want to be wise about this. So in, in a conclusion thought, here's what we learned this morning. There is no difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Not according to the Bible. There is no difference. There is no difference. There's phases, but there's one kingdom. And that's what probably mixes a lot of people up. The phases. Phase one is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Phase two, we rule and reign on earth for 1,000 years in his kingdom. What do we pray? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That will happen during the 1,000 year millennial reign. Jesus will rule all nations with a rod of iron. At the end of that 1,000 year millennial reign, 1 Corinthians 15, Christ delivers up the kingdom to God the Father. Phase three. Phase three. New heaven, new earth. Now here's my concern, is that people don't understand this, how are they really embracing the pure thought of salvation? That's my concern with this. When you get saved, what do you enter into? Well, you know, I've become a child of God. That is true. That's absolutely accurate. So we still need to look over this, and this is going to get really, really good. I want you, if you can't make it the next three or four weeks, please be sure to go to the YouTube channel because I'm walking through this whole lesson. I feel it's that important to walk through this lesson. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the morning. Bless now the service to come. Amen.